All right, <clears throat> good morning. Okay, we are back in the book of John. This is uh, another popular story. It's really good, and we can grab some teaching out of there and just some different examples. But for the most part, it's very simple. You go through the book of John, and it's very simple. The theme seems to always be about many believing or many not believing. It seems to be very much a theme of believing. The book uh, Believe is written, I think, 81 times in the book of John. So it's full of it. It's just kind of here and there, like, um, you know, just, just here and there, packed all over the place where you see it. And in every story, it's kind of the, the theme, whether they believed or not. So here's another one. John 4, 1, starting verse 1. If you have your Bibles, follow along. He says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Now you think of that, that is good that Jesus didn't uh, baptize himself. Because think about it, that would have caused, I think, issues. Can you imagine if somebody said, well, Jesus himself baptized me. Next one's like, well, one of his disciples. There would have been a little bit, you know, you could see that, or that how it could do that. People would... Um, Right, we think maybe they, there's meant more, counted more. You know, that's the question that gets asked even today. You know, you talk about baptism where you have a, you know, obviously we believe in immersion. And by we, I mean as, as a, you know, leaders of this church and many of us that come here. Not speaking for everyone. Maybe some of you disagree and that's fine. That's okay. You're, you're allowed to do, have your own discernment and your own study. That's fine. But I believe in the word baptism is the word placed into, immersion. It's like the same same thing. It's like a fancy way of saying immersion, uh, baptize. Okay, but we. Uh, but today, you know, in different churches, different groups, they say baptism is like a, a ceremonial thing. It is. Um, they look at it as okay. It's just this this thing they go through, and maybe they become part of the church, and they get a little bit of water sprinkled over them as a symbol of some washing away sins, or you know, different things that people have um, that they think baptism is. But baptism is a very simple thing. Kind of like communion. It's a simple thing. It's, it's a picture of what the Lord did. It's not, it's not actually Lord's body. It's not actually Lord's blood. But it's a picture of how he broke his body and shed his blood for us. And you take communion and as a remembrance. You know what's good? When people get baptized, immersed, they're showing a picture of how they died with Christ, were buried with him, and rose to newness of life. That their life is different. It's completely changed. All things have passed away. All things become new. It's what the, the picture is supposed to be, and it's just a picture. Some say, well, what does it do? Well, why, why do it? Why, why would I need to do it? Well, the Scripture teaches to do it. God wants you to do it. The early church practiced it. They did it. And, um, it. But baptism wasn't new with just the church. The Jews were aware of what baptism was, and they had different ceremonial cleansing and different things and that baptism represented. Before Jesus came, when John was baptizing, they weren't shocked at, you know, this baptism, what is this? Why are you doing this? Putting people in water, this is weird. Nobody said stuff like that. They were well aware of that baptism was a, a thing. It was a thing to, for whatever reason, why are you baptizing? John did unto repentance, okay? So get your life right. The king is here. It's time to repent because the kingdom is coming. But now, why you get baptized is because you have been saved. You shouldn't even consider getting baptized if you don't know where you're going. That's why we always ask people, and we're going to ask them today as well. And maybe a few of them will give their testimonies. We're going to ask them, you know, do you know 100% sure where you're going when you die? There's some people we've gotten, not directly feedback, but you've, you hear people slanderously reporting and saying stuff behind our backs, saying, how dare they say stuff like that? How dare they just you know, question them like that, like, you know, 100% for sure. <laughs> but because I want to know, are you confident? Are you confident where that your sins are gone? That you've been washed? Have you drank from the fountain of life? Have you taken this living water? So we're going to discuss this here. The woman at the well, and Jesus offers her the living water. And you need to have this. You need to have eternal life before you show the picture of what you have supposedly have. You don't get it by showing the picture. You get it by believing. So, moving on. Jesus did not baptize, it says, but his disciples baptized. So when he heard this, it was causing problems already, so he's like, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. It says he, 
and he must needs go through Samaria. So on his way, he says, we need to go through Samaria. See, he had a job in Samaria. This was part of the plan. He says, he, need, he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sakar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary and his, and his journey, <coughs> he says, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. So this is weird. This is right away out of, you could say, kosher in that, those days. A man, especially a Jewish man, shouldn't just talk to a woman, nevertheless a Samaritan woman. It would seem weird. She'd be a little bit spooked by this. Why are you even talking to me? This is, this is weird. So you've got to see this as, <laughs> as that. It is weird. He says, for his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. So it's just Jesus there and this woman now. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? Two problems. I'm a Samaritan and I'm also a woman. This is weird that you're asking me that I'm supposed to get you, get you water. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now there was... Some history here, because Samaritans are, from my understanding, mixed. They're like half Jew and half Roman. They would be mixed blood, mixed breed. And the Jews would count these Samaritans, I mean, equal to like Gentiles. In some cases, probably worse. Probably worse. So they, they have no dealings with them. They looked at them as, you're low. You're not part of our church, part of our group, not part of God's people. You're, you're, you're really low on the spectrum. So now the Samaritan woman has felt this all her life. Okay, Jews have pushed us aside. We're nobody to Jews. Jews think they're way up here and we're way down here. And so you'll see her raise these issues. She's like, okay, why are you talking to me? Usually Jews don't even, wouldn't even talk. And, and plus, I'm a woman yet. So Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would give thee living water. Now, this is interesting. Imagine how that would have sound to her. What are you talking about? Living water? If I knew who you were? Now, think about anybody to say this kind of stuff. Imagine you're witnessing somebody. If you knew who I was, <laughs> if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me. It would sound so arrogant, so proud. But see, Jesus knew who he was. For him to say this, this would have uh, obviously caught her attention. Okay, he's claiming to be somebody special. He's claiming to be not just an ordinary Jew, somebody special. And obviously, <laughs> I think she's getting the hint already that you're saying you're something special. You can give me something that nobody else can. You, can, you offer me living water. To talk about this living water a little bit, we know the story. We know what it is to be a Christian already. So we know that this is spiritual, that living water is that God is like a picture of living water. He's like a fountain. We have all these songs. I was asking Rick, hey, how many songs do we have about fountains, living water? And he's like, and he, he thought I may, maybe meant to sing my favorite song again, Fountain Free. And uh, but no, no, not that one. <coughs> but I was thinking there, there's definitely some songs. You go through a hymn book, uh, Fountain Filled with Blood. And we were thinking about singing that one. We weren't quite ready. We need more, more practice. But there's these songs <coughs> that uh, Christians have written, and they're good songs, that God is a, perfect picture of living water that this water that that comes from even the throne the bible talks about the throne of, of water coming from the throne it's clean it's pure it washes away it does things okay it's it's the water you want the water you need and he says this water is satisfying you know if you drink good water um <clears throat> with all the minerals and nutrients and stuff in there and it's clean it's pure it's satisfying but it's so dissatisfying to drink water that's dead Water that's dead, that's stagnant, or it, it's so dissatisfied. And he's going to use this. We want to go into this a little bit. <coughs> this is a good example. To say the living water is a great example of Jesus coming and saying, look, Judaism and even the, what the Samaritan's religion, this is old, stagnant, you could say cistern water. We're going to go into this. Water that just sits there. I mean, green stuff floats on there. It's dead. You don't want to drink it. You don't want to touch it. It doesn't satisfy. It's actually quite disgusting. 
And you know that's what religion is. <clears throat> religion is a picture of like a little dugout. Okay, and that's how we would understand it here in Alberta. Like a little dugout, you put water in, and I mean, it just sits there for years and years. Ducks go in there, birds fly in there, leave little frost things on there, snakes slither in there. And our kids loved it when we had the canal here, and that was even like kind of running water, but it was still kind of gross. <clears throat> but the kids loved going in for a swim. My wife and I, we found it a little bit gross because you come out of there and you got some bugs on you. They would actually be on you, like you have to wash off. It's kind of kind of gross, and we've seen a little water snake in there. I mean, it's not something you just want to go and, <clears throat> and drink of it. If you put it into your, you know, your holding tank, you definitely want good filtration system before anybody dares himself to, to drink it or do anything with it. You never know what's in there, what kind of diseases you could catch. You know, religion, <clears throat> let's look into it. Let's look into some Old Testament passages here. Look how, well, how God <clears throat> explains this. In Jeremiah 17, verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. So Jesus says, I am the fountain of living waters. See, outside of me comes this living water. Look at uh, <coughs> earlier on Jer Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. He says, For my people have committed two evils. He said, There's two evils here that my people have committed. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's the first evil. Second is, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Use the cisterns. People have left. Where, where there's water flowing from God. God would be, it would be satisfying to just have God. But you know what the Jews did? They said, no, we want a king. You know, see, God was ruling over them. God was leading them. And you know what? People weren't satisfied with that. You know, we have the same issue today. People are not satisfied with, let's say, just being a Christian, being born again, complete in him. And when you have the Lord, somehow people get dissatisfied with that. And you think, no, nobody would. But there's people that do, especially people who have come from a religion. They get, well, we need a little more. Maybe if I went to go get baptized, maybe if I added something, you know, start going to church, reading the Bible. And even though these things are okay, good things to do, but if you do it because you feel like things are stagnant and things are just blah in your life, and you want to add, you want to add, that's where religion creeps in. You want to add things to your life. How can I feel spiritual again? You know, we're living in a time when the church wants to chase spirit again. Not like he's about to tell this woman that God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. But we're living in a time when doctrines don't really matter. And I'm saying across the board of Christians, yes, in certain little groups, certain areas, maybe they, in certain areas, it's the other way around. They really exercise maybe in doctrines. They have meats, <clears throat> excuse me, they have deep teachings, but nothing to do with the spirit. They don't know how to be led by the Spirit to live the Christian life. But maybe they know a lot. They understand the Bible a lot. can really do well in Bible study and teaching the Bible. You need to have both. You need to have both. But right now, we're living in a time when people are living on a feeling. I, I did a while back, I preached a message about feelings. And it is really a problem. If people don't feel like something is spiritual, then it's not spiritual. If it doesn't quite satisfy their emotions. If the worship isn't quite loud enough, long enough, I mean moving enough, then it just doesn't feel like we worship God today. Your worship is based on a feeling and it's very, how you say it, and this they would take it as a compliment, but okay, it's very, in their mind, what they think is spirit-led. But yet you're supposed to try the spirit. The spirit leads you to truth. It leads you to truth. And there is definitely emotions that come with it. See, I'm not just bringing down the emotions. The emotions are there. It feels really good to get saved. It feels really good being saved. You know, it feels good to talk about the Bible. It feels good to have Bible study. It feels good to sing. And it should. Those things should feel good. They should feel amazing to do that. Just to talk about our Lord, sing about Him, and, you know, these memories come back, say, wow, God has done all these things for me, and wow, it's been this many years I've been saved, and where would my life be if I hadn't tasted this living water, no doubt it feels good. And it should. 
But when people rely on a feeling, when the feeling is they got saved on a feeling, they're staying saved on a feeling, and they're going to church for a feeling, it, it's, it's fake. And it just never is satisfying. You're always coming back. You know, there's groups, there's people. I've known individuals like this. They want to be involved in everything that goes on, whether at church or different events. Always going from one spiritual event to a next revival to this revival. Let's, let's get fired up again. Let's get spiritual. Let's, I want to feel saved again. That's what, they don't say that out loud, but that's pretty much what they're doing. They're trying to, they don't feel saved unless they're in church or in a revival or talking about the Bible. Somehow the day-to-day loving your wife, raising your kids, working on the yard, working at work, the day-to-day, during the week, somehow doesn't feel spiritual enough. They just don't feel spiritual doing that. Where is a, give me a spiritual event. Maybe we should take off of work and, and go to some big encounter and you know, talk about all our problems and everybody start crying and bawling. I mean, spiritual, that's what I mean. You see, you see and now many of you are like, we don't like that. <laughs> yeah, because you've seen how much fake stuff is in that. When there's that alone, that is just so fake. It lasts so little while. And people think, wow, we had an interaction with God. We had an encounter with God. And they didn't. Because religion can do that. Religion and works can do that. You don't think a Muslim feels spiritual when he goes and worships Allah and prays for hours and hours. Just think about how he feels. Have you ever considered how one of those guys feels? When he leaves and you try to preach the gospel and he would think, are you an idiot? I just talked with Allah himself. And you're trying to tell me about some prophet that lived, Jesus, wow, Allah's the one God. And in his mind, he knows. Think about it. You, you, you think he's even, he's probably doubting less than a Christian even doubts. I mean, he's confident. He's confident enough that if somebody may ask him, hey, God wants you to go blow up this building, and okay, God said to do it, do it. Think about it. You think this guy's, his feelings, he feels so sure that what he knows and what he believes is the real thing. You don't think Christians can get deceived like that? You don't think Christians can, oh, I'm, I'm sure I got saved. I, when I cried at the altar and I meant it what I said, and I, I accepted Jesus in my heart, you know there's people out there that did that and never got saved? I'm not saying all of them. But you know there's people out there that they're lost, and they're going to church, and they're going from feeling to feeling, and then to the point where they feel like maybe they drifted away and now they need to rededicate. They go back to an altar and they do it again. I mean, this is in the, let's call it Christian world going on. This is going Christian churches where a little bit of doctrines are taught. And there's a lot of them lost, lost, lost and have not experienced the living water that actually suffices, satisfies. Think about it. It needs to satisfy if Jesus doesn't satisfy you, you might not have Jesus. You've got to consider that. I mean, it's just, it's, you've got to consider that as a possibility that Jesus himself, looking to him, whenever I would even come close to nowadays doubting my salvation or thinking, you know, did I really? And check yourself. All I do is look to Christ and I get assurance. I get my assurance from no other thing than looking to Christ and what he has done. And it, it does the job. And that's how it should be. You should never look back. What, about, what did I say when I first got saved? What did I do? What did I pray? That's irrelevant. So irrelevant. What about my baptism? So irrelevant. It is so far, they shouldn't even be a consideration. It should not be a consideration whether you know the Lord or not. What you need to see is, do I have a fountain of living waters inside me? Is God himself inside of me? That spirit the Bible talks about trying the spirits. You just chase a feeling because, oh, I know I have the spirit. Every religion would testify. I've talked to Mormons. They, like, they're confident. Oh, I, I know this is the right religion. I know I have God. And we know they don't. And we know they don't. So think about it. You can see deception runs real deep, and you don't know what you don't know. So somebody can deceive themselves, but you need to go back to Scripture, and the Scripture better guide you to the truth. The Spirit's going to lead you to Scripture. If it isn't supported in the Scripture, then don't support it. This living water is different from religion. Okay? So Jesus is coming here. Think about it. This is, this is interesting because what Jesus is doing here is actually coming to this woman and saying, I know you're concerned about what church to go to, what's the right place to worship. We're going to cover that in a bit. You're concerned about all that kind of stuff. But I want to tell you, this is a dead religion here. 
I'm bringing something new. A new dispensation is coming here. And don't be worried about whether the Jews are correct or you Samaritans are right and what place to worship. That's irrelevant. Because you want to worship God, it's going to be in truth and in spirit. And you know what? I'm bringing that. I, I am it. That's what he's saying. Without me, you can't have this living water. If you just knew who I was, if you knew, you know, so many Christians out there, if they just knew who Jesus was, maybe they wouldn't chase, you know, churches and doctrines and feelings so much if they could just know who Jesus was. That is salvation itself. Once you know who Jesus is, he knows you. You're saved. That is salvation. Get to know the Lord. Immediately, you'll get saved. But if you're going to go dig your own well, dig your own cistern, I'm going to dig a hole and we're going to put some water in there and it's going to feel real good. The first day, it's going to look decently clean. We're going to put water in there and we're going to go for a swim. This is going to be awesome. Day two, it starts to smell bad. Day three, it starts to... I mean, I just look at my hot tub. I got to sit there and keep dumping chemicals in there in no time. Stuff wants to, smells bad, wants to turn green. And you're constantly cleaning that water, filtering it, filtering it, filtering it. Water that just sits there, especially warm water. If it sits there, let the sun scorch on it. In my case, the hot tub, it hates it. It just gets bacteria and things so fast. You're constantly dumping chemicals in there to try to keep that water clean. Religion is really a body of little water, and trying to, trying to keep that stuff clean, trying to keep, keep up, and just this water is just getting dirty, it's just getting stagnant, it just doesn't feel right, doesn't seem right, maybe it's not the correct thing, and, and you're right, it's not. Religion just can't do it. Works, obeying the Ten Commandments just can't do it. Going to church, reading your Bible, praying a lot, fasting, cannot do it. You're going to feel, as soon as you're not doing that, you're going to not feel spiritual. As soon as you're not in the act of doing that, you're not going to feel spiritual. So Jesus is coming here and saying, you're constantly coming back for another drink. That's really what religion is. That's the picture of religion here. You're constantly coming back, just like you need physical drink. Religion constantly requires another spiritual drink, another event, another thing, another thing, another going to the tabernacle, bring your lamb, do a sacrifice, maybe I'll feel good again. And that's how that was in that dispensation. But the Lord's saying he's changing stuff. Now we look back in John 4, verse 11. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence thou hast thou that living water? You're here, and you don't even have anything to draw out water. How are you going to give me some of this living water? So she's confused. And now you think about it. She's supposing, look, I got the tools to get water. You don't have the tools to get water. And Jesus is saying, ah, think about this. Spiritually, you don't have the tools to get the water. Spiritually, I have the tools to get this living water. I'm the only one that can get it. See, it's exactly flipped around. She's looking physically, how, how are you going to give me living water? Physically, again, you have no tools. You have nothing, no rope, no, you didn't bring a little bucket. How are you going to draw? You know, that's the, to, to religion, the same thing. How are you going to get to heaven? How are you going to do it? You have no tools. You don't have the correct tools. How are you going to do it? Jesus is the only one with the tool, with the proper tools to give you this living water. You can't get it yourself. You can't. So this woman's wondering, oh, how are you going to give me this, this water? He goes on to say, oh, she goes on to say, art thou greater than our father Jacob? saying, if, if you're able to do it, then you must be more spiritual than these guys in the past because this well, there's something special about this well. This is Jacob's well. He gave it to his kids. It says, which gave us the, the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. This is something special. Don't you know who Jacob is? He's, he's someone popular in the Bible. He drank from this well. As if Jesus doesn't know. <laughs> Just Jacob guy, like... She's asked Jesus, like, are you greater than him? Because, I mean, this well is pretty special to us Samaritans. Jacob gave it to us. Jacob drank from it for himself. This is some good water, some good stuff here. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Well, that's obvious. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of springing up into everlasting life. So now, 
I'm sure he's got her attention a little bit. I'm talking about eternal life here. I'm talking about something spiritual here. I'm talking about something that's going to forgive your sins and, and just satisfy you. Because nobody is really satisfied in their religion. The woman say, saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Well, this sounds pretty good. One drink, and I never have to come here, draw. This sounds great. Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. This is a little bit interesting because, well, this is where it gets a little bit, you could say, confrontational. This is where, I mean, if you've ever done any soul winning, and you're out there and you kind of just start to break the ice, and you want to talk about the Lord to somebody, this is the part that gets sensitive. If you're going to point out any of their sins, okay? If you're going to point out people, I mean, you even suggest they have sins. This is where people get offended, and they raise issues, and they want to debate. Instantly, you're, you're, you're kind of, they're kind of going to get in attack mode here because they feel attacked. This is where you got to be very careful when you're soul winning. Now, Jesus, I see him actually being very careful. I see how he's doing this. Very careful. What's awesome is that he says, go call that husband. Now, he already knows she's living in adultery. She doesn't have a husband right now. She, he knows that. But what's, what's interesting to see is if there was a husband involved, I still see Jesus as saying, let's go get the whole family here. And we're talk to the whole family. He's not just going to go separately like a Jehovah Witness does. They like to come to your house and just talk to the wife. Try to convert the wife and go against her husband. To the point, if she gets, starts to come to church, they'll even tell, if he doesn't want to come here, you should leave him. There's churches that do that kind of stuff. It's terrible. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus, if you have a husband, go get him. Then we'll talk about this more. Then I'll give you some of this water. I'll really explain it. You guys can come as a family to me. Okay, so that's thought number one. Now look on what else he says. He says, The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. In other words, you're being honest. You, it's true what you're saying. I agree. He says, For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidest thou truly. This would have, I mean, kind of sucked for her. But it's also a little bit of a miracle because this would have been kind of a secret. How do we even know she had five husbands in her lifetime in that same town? They could have been some from her like previous areas that she lived. So this would have been obviously, how do you know? You're a Jew. You never even talked to us Samaritans. Here's a Jew. And how do you know I've been married five times? Now, here is where a little debate comes in because people like to think, she had a husband, he died, she got married again, had a husband, died, and she got married again five times. I don't think so. I'm actually very confident. I do not think so at all. I do not believe that. These are divorces and remarriages. Some say, oh no, Jesus would have never advocated that because there's a belief out there, very popular, especially in a Mennonite background, that once you get married to a woman, even after you get a legal divorce, and then you go marry somebody else, that is a sin to do that that that's not really your wife now. That's not really your new wife. Your other one is the real wife, and the one you're living with now is just an adultery. That's not true. Jesus recognized every one of these guys as husbands, and he's calling out on her things that she's done, like wrong. Okay, not just something, oh, I just know a secret about. These are, these are things that she would have been ashamed of. You got to see that. You got to see it in the context. She was ashamed of these things. This was supposed to be secret. This is supposed to be something she would even feel guilty about. I think Jesus is touching something that she has in her mind that she's, well, I'm a bad person. In other words, this is, if, if she ever thinks about if I'm spiritual or not, I'm sure she thinks, thinks of these things. Look at all these divorces. I'm with a guy right now. I'm not even married. That this is where she's under guilt. So Jesus is just attacking right at the right spot saying, See, you're a great big sinner. See, these are divorces and remarriages, and each guy was a husband after divorce and married again. Now, there's no wise that I'm advocating divorce and remarriage, but I do not believe that if somebody gets divorced and remarried that they're still married to that first wife. But it is an act of a one-time, let's say, an adultery if you have not been cheated on, okay? 
if the partner has not gone out on you, remember Jesus said, except for fornication. We're not going to cover it too deeply, but we've done this before. You can go look at the, my Matthew series and stuff where I talk about this kind of stuff. And there I go in a little bigger detail. But he, he's, he's recognizing every one of these as husbands. So when she was with the new guy, they were individual husbands. That's why the people that would believe that, no, your first one is still the husband and now you're just in adultery, they would say, oh, no, they could have, they could have died. Uh, di- all of them died and she's married again. There's no point for Jesus to really bring this up. And they know it sounds weird. It just doesn't fit their doctrine, right? Because it seems to support divorce and remarriage. Like, in other words, you're not going on sinning. It's not that big of a deal. That's how it sounds. It sounds like the way I'm preaching right now, they say, well, John, the way you're talking, divorce is not that big of a deal. It wouldn't really affect your Christian life. I think it greatly affects you. Let me just make sure that, you know, we do not promote divorce and remarriage, but let's do it the biblical way. It's going to wreck your kids. It's going to, I think you will have a lifelong suffering if that happens. If you're going to go through a divorce and a remarriage, your life, let's say it this way, will never be as full of grace and as full of, um, you know, as normal as somebody who's just one marriage, lives all the way through, raises kids, family all together. It won't be at, not nearly as blessed. Can God work with the second marriage? Could, it be, could you be decently happy again? All those kind of things. Could it work out? If you're, let's say if there's somebody here, that, and I have no idea, I, I hope there's not, but if you have been divorced and re- married again, you continue on right where you're at. And yes, God can bless you. God can be with you in the marriage and you can be a spiritual person once again, you could say. And you don't leave that situation because that would be just, it just gets worse. No, st- wherever, whatever marriage you're in, stick that one through. So we obviously promote get married and that should be the one. First marriage, make it last. That's the blessed life. That's the way God intended it. One woman for life till death do your part. That's, that's obviously how we, we teach it and preach it. We don't need to preach some false doctrine just to scare people or to control people. A lot of times it's a control act. Well, if you're going to go and, you know, you're with this new wife now and you're going to, you know, if you're not willing to leave her and go back to your first one, then we're going to shun you in the church. And so they're trying to force him in one way. It's not right to do that. But I am not for divorce. It's an ugly thing. But if you had gone through it, then life happens and, I would say, move on. And we're not going to treat you any differently around here. But Jesus recognized her sins, her issues, the things. This would have touched her real deep. This would have been a little bit like, exactly like I said, if you went out to witness somebody, you touched them in an area that was sensitive to them. You knew about certain deep sins they had. And you mentioned that. You know what they would do? Similar to what, what she's about to do. Let's read on. He said, you've had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. And that's how so truly. Woman, the woman saith unto him, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that thou art, art a prophet. He's like, well, there's no way you're supposed to know that. So you're something special. You're a prophet. Jerusalem, this is it, interesting. Why does she do this? this it's, you got to almost see the motive a little bit because a little bit of teaching in that. Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Oh, I, I, let's go back. Verse 20. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Right away she wants to know what's the correct place to worship God. Let me first even explain something about worship. Because you hear from time to time, I don't want you guys to be confused in this, okay? But you hear from time to time. People will even come around here and they'll ask, how is your worship? Now, I've been around long enough to know they mean, how's the singing? How's the singing? You know that the Bible doesn't say worshiping is singing, okay? Now, certainly you can worship God by singing, but I mean, people look at worshiping as solely as singing to the Lord. Yet, being, <laughs> being obedient to the Lord is worshiping the Lord. Praying to him is worshiping. I mean, just walking after the Spirit is worshiping to God. You will see it not, it's not, he's not saying we went up this mountain to just sing a song there, to worship the Lord. And the Jews just go into the temple to sing a song. Certainly they did that. But it was a place of worshiping God, doing what God wants you to do, and giving him praise. Yes, there's praise, honor, glory. You'd be praying, you could be loving the brethren. All these things are, when they're pleasing to God, you're worshiping God. 
He's saying, in other words, when you sincerely love God, follow God, you're worshiping him. Okay, you, all, you have passages like where the, a guy was healed um, and, and he went, worship Jesus saying. So in other words, what he said to God, like, wow, thank you for doing this. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Or he, he would just thank Jesus. It was called that he worshiped Jesus saying this and this. He didn't start singing a song. You see, so the word worship is not synonymous with going to church and singing. So people say, how is your worship at church? Well, you're, <laughs> biblically what you're actually asking, you don't, but I know you're not, but what you're actually saying is, how is everything spiritually? How do you guys, how pleased is God with you? Are you guys actually worshiping him? I would say we are. I would say yes. I believe uh, when I, we come here and we, we hear God's word, we sing together, we pray together, just the whole meeting all together. Yes, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think we're not worshiping God. We do this because we're honoring, glorying, praising God's name, talking about it, these kind of things. So that is worshiping. Okay, she wants to know, where do you go? Where does God want you to go? What is the correct place to worship him? In that dispensation, in the Old Testament still here, Christ had not yet died. This is still fully Old Testament, even though it's in the New Testament. You guys see it. There are different times. There was a correct place to go worship. And it was in Jerusalem. So she's asking a little bit of a tricky question. It's actually kind of a, a debate question here. Well, you're a Jew, okay, and I see that you're something special. You just prophesied here a little bit. You knew something that nobody else knew. What do you say? You know what? She's already a little bit defensive about it. Are you saying I don't go to the correct church? Now, I've had this, and maybe many of you had too. You go to somebody, especially if they have any religious background, and you preach, hey, you must be born again, you try to teach them. Why? Why are you saying that? You, you think that, what, if I go to Old Colony, that's not good enough? You don't, th you don't think my baptism counts? You also, you think that the this just means nothing. Your church is perfect, and everybody else is off the way to hell. Is that what you think? That's kind of what she's doing. So what? We're bad people? Us Samaritans, we're no good? The place where we worship, that's not actually worshiping God? That doesn't count? It's in Jerusalem? I'm guessing that's what you're about to say, right? You're the only correct church? You're the only correct group? Is that what you're about to say? See, that's what she's expecting. Now, I don't think she had quite that attitude, but nonetheless, her first thought is the same thing as you'll come across when you go preach to anybody a little bit religious. Oh, what? So you want me to go to your church then, eh? Our church ain't good enough. Our church doesn't have the gospel preached. You think only your church preaches the gospel, nobody else preaches the gospel? You hear stuff like that, right? As soon as you suggest they need something because they thought they were perfectly okay where they're at, and you go suggest that they need to get born again, they're going to assume, oh, so where I go and worship is not good enough, eh? He says, <laughs> listen to this. He says, where do you say? Verse 22, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. He says, you don't really understand this. You don't really know the whole picture. You don't really understand this. Say, we, the Jews. He says, salvation was of the Jews. Okay, that's just all over Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture do you find anything positive even about Samaritans. Okay? Nothing spiritual ever happens other than Jesus sitting down here and now a bunch of people start following him. I mean, this is the only thing we even hear about Samaritans being anything special. It's after Jesus meets with them. Before that, nothing special, no, nothing big, nothing, nothing good like you do in, among the Jews, among Israel, among the, the chosen people. He says, but, so he says, yes, it's true, okay. Jerusalem, the temple, Salvation is of the Jews, okay? And it was to the Jews only, in a sense. And he says, so, but, I want to tell, tell you something, though. Let's ignore that fact. You know, same thing with you on the street. Sometimes you have to give that answer. Okay, yes, I don't believe your baptism counts, but, listen, I'll right away kind of like defend it, but that's not important here. See, they're trying to bring the conversation somewhere else. I'm trying to say, I don't care if you were immersed or sprinkled, that doesn't count. I was Look, that, that's not the point. What I'm trying to make, I'm trying to steer it back into, I'm trying to give you the gospel, I'm trying to get you born again. And they're trying to have a religious debate. So you've got to constantly steer that thing very carefully, just like Jesus says. 
Look, here's your answer. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It must be both, and it is crucial to understand both. Think of truth as understanding the Bible. Think of spirit as, I mean, everything you think of spiritual. Especially, yes, there's a lot of feelings that come with that kind of stuff. But when it's just feelings and there's no truth, I mean, you're not really worshiping God. Say, oh, we have great worship, sweating and swaying and this and that, flopping around the floor. No, you're not. No, you are not. Somebody say, oh, yes, I felt it. I don't care what you felt. But I can go to a rock concert, and I felt pretty good there too. Head banging, mosh pit. It was a lot of fun. We left, and we said, wow, that was an awesome event. Okay, and it had all kinds of feelings. Like this is, wow, that was such a great experience. And it's no different. Feelings, we're human. You're going to have feelings. When you had enjoyed your time in the flesh, you enjoyed and you say, no, but this was godly. This, look, you need to really look. If it, look at truth. Look at truth. You can't just have this spiritual feeling without the truth. You shouldn't have truth without the spirit. You should, they should go together. The spirit should lead you in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. He wants you to know something. This is why it's like that. This is why God doesn't care much about your church building your events, your stuff, your religion, the things you do, the clothes you wear. Why God doesn't care too much because he's spirit. God is a spirit. He wants to get you more like him. Right now we're so far like him. He says, look, God is a spirit. If you're going to worship him, you're going to talk to him, you're going to praise him, you're going to glorify him, you're going to honor him, you need to see who he is. He is a spirit. He's not trapped in some body. Okay, he came down in a body for a time. But think about it. He says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He says it again. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he come, <coughs> he will tell us all things. What he's saying is, man, the stuff you're saying right now, like, maybe you're not just a prophet. Because I do know when the Messiah's come, she's heard this before. When the Messiah is going to come, he's going to tell us all things. Think about it. He just told her some secret things about herself. And she's like, wow, are, are, are you the Messiah? That's what she's pretty much saying here. You must be the Messiah because you're doing exactly what we kind of expect the Messiah to do. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Wow, that was simple. Wow, that was blunt. Why did Jesus not do it to the scribes and Pharisees? They often asked them, hey, by whose authority are you baptizing? He's like, let me ask you a question. By whose authority did John baptize? And it was kind of, they were caught between the bull and the horns. And they're like, well, all we cannot tell you. He's like, I can't tell you either. In other words, you can't answer my question. I'm not answering yours. He didn't want to answer theirs. He knew they couldn't answer his. So he trapped them <clears throat> to avoid telling them. Why? Because his hour was not yet. He knew that as soon as he was that blunt with them, they'd kill him too soon. But with a Samaritan, he's not worried about her. He's not worried about telling her, being right blunt. I'm the Messiah. I am he, the one talking to you. I'm the guy. I'm the one. I mean, she could, he was just right blunt, just straight to the point. He, he couldn't do that with the scribes and Pharisees. I mean, what's she going to do? Write up a report and go tell the Jews? The Jews and Samaritans didn't have any dealings. So he's being real bold, real blunt with, with the Samaritans here. He doesn't fear them at all. They're not going to mess up the prophecy here. He says, And upon this came his disciples, so around this time the disciples come back, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? They knew, obviously he knows what he's doing, but they're wondering, What is he doing? Why is he doing this? They had probably so many questions. What's going on here? I thought salvation is the Jews. I thought you just care about us. And you see their confusion? <clears throat> The woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? So, see, she's pointing out, saying, He was able to name these sins of mine. He was able to tell me these things, know things about me. He's like, this has got to be the Christ, right? And what's interesting is she doesn't go tell a bunch of women. She goes and tells men. Maybe she just had men friends. Or maybe she really need, 
get the important people out there that have any kind of authority in their groups, their settings, and maybe that lead the worship on the mountain. Whatever it was, she goes and tells the men, come and see, I think this is the Christ. Like, you guys need to confirm this. She's already a believer. And what indicates that is she leaves her water pot. She leaves her water pot. She's a believer. She, wow, this is the guy. She's forgot what she even came to get water. Obviously, she's going to need to still drink as long as she lives. But think of it. This is a perfect example of she doesn't need that water pot spiritually anymore. Spiritually, she doesn't need it. Drop it. You know, religion the same way. Drop the religion. Drop the religion. When you have Christ, drop the religion. You don't need it. I'm not saying dropping good works. But drop the religion. Drop the act. Make sure it's real. Whatever you got, whatever you're doing, do it for real. Do it because you love people. You know, we were talking about being hospitable and stuff like that because we were in the chapter of 1 Peter. We are talking being how we're supposed to be hospitable to one to another and stuff. And without grudging. You're supposed to do this without grudging. And you think about that kind of stuff. Religious people, <clears throat> they'll have people over or something, but they'll a lot of times grudge about it. They, they won't actually enjoy it. They won't actually enjoy their time. They, won't, they do it because they feel like it's their duty. Hey, as a church, have each other over. Invite each other over. Don't do it if you don't actually want to. Don't do it with grudging. In other words, don't do it to play some religious game. Hey, these other people all have people over. Maybe if we want to be good Christians, we need to have people over. For, that's the wrong reason. Have people over if you actually want them over. They only want to come to your house if you actually want them, okay? So don't invite somebody if you don't actually want them over because you're being a two-face. If you actually want to get to know people, you actually want to love them, and you actually want to bless them, give them food, do it with that. And everything you do, it should be done like that. It should be done for real. It shouldn't be done because of some religion. Drop the water pot. Stop drawing your own water. Stop digging your own wells. That's the message here. Moving on, he goes to say, then they, went, <coughs> then they went out of the city and came unto him. And the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. So they just bought food and they say, Eat. Here, you must be hungry. You, got, you need to eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him ought to eat? And they're confused. What, are you, what is he talking about? He has meat. Now, he's just talking about water, the, like spiritual water. Now he's talking about spiritual food. He's like, look, I have food that you guys don't quite understand, that you don't, you don't have. You don't have access, access to it like I do. Now, there is some teaching in this here too. And if you've done any, again, soul winning, preaching, or teaching, you will know that food sometimes can actually just slip your mind. A lot of times I'm preaching, I'm caught up. See, for you guys, you get hungry. All of a sudden you're like, man, I'm physically hungry. When is he done preaching? How long is this going to take? But it feels different when you're preaching. When you, when you worked on a message, you have so much to say and you're excited about it, you get excited about it and you're preaching. I really do feel like you're being fed. As soon as I'm done, I'm like, wow, I'm hungry. All of a sudden it kicks in like, okay, now let's go to the house and eat. But a lot of times you forget. You forget about food. You can do a study sometimes, and you can just study through supper, this, and you're like, I don't want to eat. Like, I don't need to eat. Like, you literally feel like, I don't have an appetite. And it is weird. I think more people can testify this, this feeling. How sometimes you can maybe witnessing somebody for hours, and you're not eating, drinking. You're not food and drink, and all that is the last thing on your mind. You're just so caught up. It can be for hours. And you're like, you're, you feel fed. You feel satisfied. You're not thinking of food at that time. I mean, if you think about it, that is a version of fasting that is different than, you know, people going into it willingly. Okay, I'm not going to eat for three, four days. And I can see that as being a real challenge and stuff. But this way of fasting is different. It's actually a whole lot easier because you feel like you're actually being fed. You actually feel like, I, I'm not thinking of food. I don't need food. I'm busy right now doing something spiritual. So this is interesting. For Jesus to say this, you can actually relate to this kind of stuff. You can actually relate that God actually feeds you. God can actually get your mind off of food where it's like, I don't need food. I have meat that you guys don't, don't understand. Jesus says unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. When you're ministering, when you're doing that kind of stuff, you're being fed. God is feeding you to do his work. He will give you what to say, what to do, and it is satisfying. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. 
So it is kind of obvious that he's probably talking about that time that, look, right now, about another four months and harvest is physically there around where they live. But he said, don't say that right now. Don't say that harvest is four months from now. He says, behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now, what Jesus is saying here, uh, this is what I believe that he's saying here. The woman just ran into the town. She's telling the men, and the men are now on their way to go meet Jesus, see Jesus. And he's up on this hill where this well is with his disciples, and he's saying, look out in the field, and he's seeing the people coming. He's saying, that's the harvest. That's what we're harvesting right now, people. He says, the, the harvest is ready. Don't say, he says, look out there ready, and you could see probably a bunch of little these white robes. He says, look at the field already, and people coming. Okay, Jesus had great success here preaching. And he says, look at, don't say that, oh, you know, harvest is later. It's now. He says, look at the fields. He says, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. 36, and he that reapeth receiveth wages. He's telling them, guys, guys, reap the harvest. You're going to get wages for this. I'm going to reward you for this. And gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Jesus just sow, okay? And now the word's being spread. The seed has been dropped. And now it's ready for the disciples to actually reap the harvest. And he says, look, we're going to rejoice together. He says, we're, we're in this, this work together, the Lord's work. And herein is that saying true. One soweth, another reapeth. Sowing is when you go to a place where, I mean, nobody's really dropped the seed. There's nothing that could take root. They haven't heard about Jesus. They don't know about him. They don't, they don't know what to think. They only know their religion. You go to a place like that, you are sowing. When usually around here, somebody's already heard. Somebody's probably dropped the seed already. Somebody's already told them, maybe at a very young age already. And they're in religion. You think about it, you need to go reap them. Their curiosity is already there. And you just need to convert them over. And that would be reaping. He says, I sent you to reap that wherein ye bestow no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that of that city believed on him. See, the story ends with this, that many believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and abode, and he abode there two days. This would have been odd and weird for a Jew to do this. You don't just stay the night, eat their food with Samaritans. Jews wouldn't have done that. Jesus and his disciples now did. And many more believed because of his own word. See, so many weren't quite convinced just hearing the woman's testimony, but she did get a lot of converts just telling her story. But he says, many of them later after they heard Jesus himself, then they believed of his own word. And they said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this indeed is, is indeed the Christ the Savior of the world. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet, ha- prophet hath no honor in his own country. So Jesus himself said it. Look, in your own country, you're not going to be as effective. And he says, so he's leaving the, the, the place. Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went in unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Jesus always seems so disappointed that people don't want to believe until they see signs. So disappointed. He says, The noble man said unto him, Sir, come down, he says, or my child die. He said, look, if you don't come, my child's going to die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. 
And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servant met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then he inquired he of, of, them to, uh, of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So you see, this was quite the journey where this guy had come to see Jesus. So he's on his way back, and he meets somebody on the way, and he already, so before he's even home, he finds out his son is, is doing good. He's well. The fever left him. He's, he's healthy again. And he says, wow, what, at what time? When did this happen? He said, well, so-and-so hour yesterday, that was the exact time. He says, wow, that was the exact hour. Within that hour, I was talking to Jesus. So he's seen a clear miracle there. He says, so that the father knew that it was the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. See, that's, it, it, it can get converts like that. You see miracles like that? So this guy, is, he's believing Jesus. Hey, go home. He's going to live. On his way home, he finds out, okay, well, wow, he's healed, completely healed. Once he sees the miracle like that, now and it says now, now he's really secure. Now he's really believing, well, that was the Christ. I just met the Christ, the Messiah. And it says his whole house. I mean, that's how it should be. You think about somebody converts, somebody believes. I mean, you'll see this often in Scripture, the whole house believes. I think today, just a thought here, why it's not so popular is because families are so divided. If families are really like together, together and close, I think when one of them meets the Lord, I think it's very easy for the whole house to convert. If families were a, very united, very close, I mean, their thoughts, their feelings, their everything, they're tight, a tight family. I think a tight family, the way in Lord, the Lord intended it, I think if the husband gets saved, no doubt the wife and kids will follow. I think that's how it should be. That's how you'll see it often. Oh, him and his house. So he's, they see this miracle, and the, obviously the whole house converts. I think even if there's servants or any of that kind of stuff, that's what it means, the whole house. Anybody around, connected, involved, that believe. It says, and, and his whole house. This is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. The chapter's over. So this is only his second miracle at this time yet. And he's about to cause some real trouble. Next, <clears throat> next chapter, he's going to heal a blind man by the pool, by the water, 38 years laying there. And it's on a Sabbath day. And anything after that, I mean, the Jews are just out to kill him. And they're bringing this up. They're bringing stuff like this up. But not only that, he, <clears throat> he talked down the temple, says, I'll tear it down, I'll build it up in three days. I mean, that was reason itself to kill him. But once they, he starts, it looks like he's breaking laws. He's healing on a Sabbath, breaking one of the, come on, they dug a cistern. They had this, this system of way of living, and this was good. This was the way. Jesus comes says, I have something better. I have living water. I have meat that you guys don't know of. You guys don't understand. I have something better, something else. And if you guys just knew who it was, he's thinking, well, you guys would be asking me. You'd be following my religion. But when people make their own, they follow their own. I mean, it, it, it gets terrible. And you, you will reject Jesus himself. See, by following religion, I'm going to end with this. By following <coughs> a religion, if you say, no, I have Christ, but I just, you got to add works. Like if you have that faith plus works kind of mentality, kind of attitude, you're, you, you believe in what I call, <laughs> you know, like the faith sandwich, right? Okay, faith you add, is like the meat maybe, okay, and the bread is the works, and the mayo is false doctrine. Obviously, we're going to put that in there. And you kind of have this, whole, no, you got to have it all together, okay? And they have this, that, that's the complete thing. It, it's not how it is. When you have it like that, you mix it. Some of you are laughing at the mayo thing. I think the whole church knows by now, right? I don't like mayo. I don't know why I tell you that. It's just, I felt like it was necessary. <laughs> it's just no good, okay? So we're all going to use that as false doctrine, still being on the milk. Frank would say cheeses, rotten milk. He says, you're still on the milk. You need to get onto the meat. But nonetheless, we have our different things. But when it comes to spiritual food, let's talk about spiritual food. That's why it's to bring food in this. You're talking about spiritual food. People only seem satisfied. Like, it's not complete. Like, just eating meat is not complete. Maybe meat and a glass of milk. And it wouldn't. It wouldn't really seem to be 
my wife had that ready, you know, especially if it was like a couple times a week, I'd be like, why aren't you making food anymore? You know, where, where's like the bread, the potatoes, the beans, or the, the, the other stuff? You know, I feel like people get the same way with church. You know, we've had it even in this church. People come here and kind of, well, where's your, like, Sunday school? Where's uh, youth programs? Where's VBS? Where? And so many things, they're fine. We could do some of these things. We've kind of scratched the whole Sunday school thing. Now, we want to keep family tight, families together in church like this. We do want to eventually get that nursery completely done with a speaker. So if you have a screaming kid that's just out of control, and it happens from time to time. And the rest of us, we're just going to suffer it through because we've all been there, we've done that, and it's good. We want to keep families together. Even though both people have come here and they've literally said this with their own mouth. They've said like, you guys, it's a good church what you guys have here. It's a good start. Like, I mean, what do you mean by start? Like, in other words, I can see that like you haven't arrived yet in a sense. They don't say it like that, but they say like, it's a good start. The way you guys, oh yeah, you got the carpet now, you got the stage. I mean, as if you're missing something yet. What? You're missing, wow, real worship yet. You're missing that and maybe some Sunday schools and youth programs and, you know, maybe, okay, send out some missionaries and some people feel like we, we need more things because I wouldn't feel spiritual enough coming to a church like this. That's pretty much what they're saying. And I don't really take much offense to it because I'm like, what I always say to them, do you know who you're talking to? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't say that. <laughs> I'm like, you don't understand. You don't know how we're actually satisfied. People are shocked that, that, you, that many of you are satisfied with this. You know, people that have been in church and different religions for so long, maybe come check out this group. They've said this. You know, they've said this right to me. I've had a few people say this kind of stuff. Not more than one. Along these lines, I'll paraphrase a little bit, but along the lines of, this is a good start. It's like an early church just starting, and it, that's all good. And, you know, wait till you kind of arrive, till you really, kind of like where I go to church. Like, everything's there. We have everything. Like, everything's in place, you know? Like, all the proper people, proper things, proper programs, everything. Because they cannot believe that guys like you guys would be actually satisfied with just Bible doctrine, sing a little bit, pray, and just, you know, we, we keep it simple and then we go live our lives. You know, some, just very few come out on Friday Bible studies. Some of different groups they go to do their own thing, studies on themselves, take a weekend, go camping. And a lot of people just wouldn't feel spiritual enough that, like that. Like how, how do you feel satisfied with a church like that? How do you feel, okay, it's, I wouldn't feel spiritual enough. That's pretty much what they're saying. They are saying, I know people well enough, and you know too. They say, it's just, you need more things. There's got to be more fired up things happening. Things that just really move our spirits. Otherwise, we, we're just, just Bible doctrine and, I mean, just living for the Lord. You know, like, you, you need something more emotionally. Stir people. Nobody ever cries in your services. Nobody ever just starts swaying like crazy. I'm like, yeah, we do sometimes. But we still have a Mennonite background. That's hard for us to do. I'm okay if you guys want to do this when we're singing. I'm okay. Whatever. But you, you know what I mean? But some people say, no, you're not even worshiping if you don't do that. I disagree with you. Of course I'm worshiping. And the person that's just sitting there all, amazing grace, not making a scene. I'm not thinking, oh, he's stagnant. He's maybe not even saved. Oh, he's, he doesn't nearly love the Lord as the next guy. That means nothing to me. It means nothing, guys. I mean, if you want to express yourself one way, totally fine. Totally, you're actually totally free to do that. Don't look down on people who do express themselves. Um, let's go on the flip side. If somebody wants to express, if that's their way of, that's awesome. That's fine. That's fine. But I do have a problem with people say, <clears throat> well, you're not really worshiping then. Because that's just not true. And then I see their low understanding of scripture. Their low understanding of worship. That go home, love your wife, go have a good marriage. That's, that's honoring to God. Go train your children. Get them to love God. Wow, you're a spiritual person. Do that. I mean, that's a good start. And I would say start with that. And then when there's time, come to church. You know, hear a message. Invite each other over. Have each other over. Get to know other Christians. Hear their testimonies. If somebody's doubting their salvation, maybe they rely on a sinner's prayer. Be hospitable. You're like a hospital to them. Give them the gospel. Share it. Make it clear to them. Give them something that you've learned in the scripture that God has done in your life. 
they can walk away and feel healed, feel amended, feel uplifted, and they go away worshiping God. And the next week, they're at work, and man, now the gospel makes sense. Finally, we went to so-and-so house, and the way he just explained it was a much better job than John Bolt did. And he explained it now, it just makes sense. And he's worshiping God all week. That is awesome. And if that person comes here and just sits here quietly and just interested into the Bible and stuff, I mean, he's spiritual. Real spiritual. You see my point in this kind of stuff? Well, people have this outward visible thing. We want the outward. We want the feeling. We want the stuff. And I do too. Uh, to a certain extent, I do too. I want that to be a result of it. I want to see some outward things as a result. First of all, it's a good testimony. I want people to see that I love the Lord. I want people to see my good works and then be I want that life. I want that. That way when I witness to them and say, yeah, I want what you have. I can see that you love God. That's good. That's good. But if that's all you have, you're just striving for that. You are a man, dig, a woman digging your own cistern putting some water in there and wondering why it goes bad, why it's not staying fresh, because it needs to be running water. It needs to be flowing. And only Jesus can draw you that kind of water. Only Jesus and Jesus himself. When you believe and when you trust in him alone, it suffices. It is enough. You feel satisfied. And you come to church with other people who are like-minded and you say, no, it's good. Yeah, well, nothing, it's good. It's fine. These people, they believe it like I do. I'm happy to go to church that people believe what I believe. That is shocking in itself that, you know, you can find that nowadays. All right, I said I'd be done. Let's pray and then we'll have some fellowship. Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for just all that you, and most of all that you died on the cross for us and paid our sin debt. And Lord, you are satisfying to us. Many of us can testify that, agree to that. We're going to uh, plan on Lord willing. Lord, we want to do a baptism and show a picture of what you've done in, in their lives and maybe uh, give them the boldness to share a testimony and, and explain to people um, how it is that they come to, to understand this, to take a drink of the living water and why, um, why it is that they, they now believe. And Lord, that it's a beautiful thing. Maybe others can stand by and hear and wonder and, and want the same thing. Maybe somebody that's lost. Lord, let this be a picture of how you uh, came into their life and just turned it around, changed everything, and for the better. We thank you for doing that. We thank you for leaving us a book that we can trust, and read, and study, and preach out of. Lord, I thank you for giving me this message and just the gift of teaching and preaching. Lord, I hope it uh, makes sense. Lord, I pray that you would do a work even during the week in their people's minds if there's any questions or thoughts. Lord, that they would study for themselves also and maybe uh, ask questions, but not just stop there, not just... Um, just go back to their religion. Go back to whatever it is they always believed, <clears throat> Lord, that we would see and want to believe what the Scripture has to say, what you have to tell us. Help us to do so. We always grow and learn, and I just ask uh, that you bless each and every one that came out this morning. Bless them with a good time. Keep them safe, and, and that they enjoy a great fellowship with one, one with another. And I thank you again, Jesus' name I pray. Amen.